hello guys welcome to another tutorial video in today's video i'll be looking on an introduction to hematology as well as i'll be looking on erythropoiesis now let's start with the blood the blood is actually eight percent of your total um, body weight your blood consists of red blood cells white blood cells platelets and we look on the functions of these as we go along now the volume of blood is different for males and females so females they have less blood so four to five liters right while males they have approximately five to six liters of blood so it's easy to remember it's counting four to five five to six also blood is much more viscous or thicker than wa um, water and it has somewhere near a neutral pH about 7.45 okay all right so the functions of the blood are basically one most important for transportation so nutrients oxygen and all of that stuff can be transported in the blood secondly it is needed for defense mainly through our white blood cells to fight off infections it is also playing a role in hemostasis right which is basically clotting of your blood after an injury or a cut or anything like that and four it is playing a role in homeostasis which is basically ensuring that the environment of the body is maintained at an ideal temperature and a... all right so let's look on the formed elements that are present um, in the blood the first one is your erythrocytes so erythrocyte is just a fancy name for the red blood cell and they are usually biconcave um, in structure and they don't have a nucleus this is very important so no nucleus is present and they have a lifespan of about 120 days they're about now their main function is to transport of course oxygen in your blood as well as to get rid of the carbon dioxide so it plays a very important role in respiration next we have your leukocytes and your leukocytes is just a fancy name for your white blood cells and these leukocytes are divided into two categories right a granulocytes means they don't have any granules and they have granulocytes right which they have granules so the a granulocytes they end with site so monocyte is one as well as your lymphocytes right and then your granulocytes are basically your fills so your neutrophils right your eosinophils sorry and your basophils and then lastly you have your plate um, let's right so the functions of their leukocytes are different so a granulocytes so your monocytes those are what forms your macrophages and are important in phagocytosis so if there's any um, decaying or dead cells then this will get rid of them basically your lymphocytes are in your B and T lymphocyte cells and of course plays an important role in your specific immune response as regards to your granulocytes neutrophils are usually the first set of um, elements that are responsive to any form of injury or any immune response they're also important um, in phagocytosis your eosinophils these are important in parasitic infection. So if you get infested by worms or things like that, and also allergic reactions. And then your basophils, these are what releases anticoagulant called heparin. And as we go further, we will learn about the important role of heparin. And finally, your platelets, they survive only five to nine days usually um and just to note the leukocytes they have the longest um lifespan okay so some may last even up to 300 days in some cases 
right so the platelets function is for clotting all right so when you get a cut platelets are important to stabilizing the wound and forming your scar and they also can release an hormone called serotonin right and serotonin is important for vasoconstriction right especially after um, cell injury all right so now we're going to move on to erythropoiesis now erythropoiesis is an irreversible process right so that is important for you to know and it is basically under the influence of an hormone called erythropoietin right or what we call EPO for short and this hormone is generally influencing committed stem cells right that are present in the bone marrow to undergo changes so differentiate and divide and mature into um, specific um, cells right so that's basically the process of it so it may be to form red blood cell it may be um, the process to form white blood cells or platelets in some cases so so the production of your red blood cell is at different sites based on the life stage that you are so like in early fetal life right before the second month of pregnancy I should say the major site of production for a red blood cell is the yolk sac now as we progress to the second um, through the second to seventh month then it's the liver and the lymph node and also your spleen right so these become um, the major site of erythropoiesis it should be noted that the liver the lymph node and the spleen continues to produce it until about two weeks after birth however it's not the major one but it still produces it up to the second week after pregnancy all right so during the eighth and the ninth month the bone marrow now takes over and becomes the major site of red cell production now in childhood it should be noted that all bones right are important in the formation of red blood cell but with increasing age right um, certain bones are no longer actively producing red blood cell and so things like the sternum which is the breastbone the ribs and the pelvis are basically the major site of red cell production as you get older and older moving on we're going to look on the different stages um, between the committed stem cell or the undifferentiated stem cell forming your mature red blood cell so we start off with the CFU um, gem and this just means that it can form anything so this colony forming unit can go to form either granulocytes, erythrocytes, monocytes, um, platelets, etc. Right. So this now becomes the bursting forming unit and it's now for the erythrocytes, right? Because that's what we're looking at. And then from the bursting forming units, it forms the colony forming unit of E, right? Erythrocytes now specialized. After this stage, it forms the pro erythroblast right and the pro erythroblast under the influence of your epo and as we said remember epo is an erythropoiesis poetin sorry forms your erythroblast right and then from the erythroblast it forms your reticulocytes Right? But before it forms a reticular site, the nucleus present in the erythroblast is removed or expelled. Right? And so the reticular site does not have a nucleus. On the reticular site, um, it goes along into the bloodstream for one to two days until it matures into your red blood cell, which doesn't have a nucleus. So the nucleus gets expelled between the formation of the reticular sites 
from your urethra blast so that's an important step that you should note moving on we're going to look on the different stages um between the committed stem cell or the undifferentiated stem cell forming your mature red blood cell so we start off with the cfu um gem and this just means that it can form anything so this colony forming unit can go to form either granulocytes erythrocytes monocytes um, platelets etc right so this now becomes the bursting forming unit and it's now for the erythrocytes right because that's what we're looking at and then from the bursting forming units it forms the colony forming unit of e right erythrocytes now specialized after this stage it forms the pro erythroblast blast right and the pro erythroblast under the influence of your epo and as we said remember epo is a erythropoiesis poetin sorry forms your erythroblast right and then from the erythroblast it forms your reticulocytes Right? But before it forms a reticular site, the nucleus present in an erythroblast is removed or expelled. Right? And so the reticular site does not have a nucleus. On the reticular site, um, it goes along into the bloodstream for one to two days until it matures into your red blood cell, which doesn't have a nucleus. So the nucleus gets expelled between... The formation of the reticular sites from your erythroblast so that's an important step that you should note also it should be noted that at the pro erythroblast stage at this stage is where the nucleus begins to appear and it's where rna starts to be present so at this point the cell is capable of producing hemoglobin and the rna remains um, in the cell until the reticular site stage. Now, after the reticular site stage, the mature red blood cell um, loses this RNA and therefore can no longer produce hemoglobin. So hemoglobin starts at the proerythroblast stage and so does the formation of the nucleus and the RNA is present. So therefore it is able to produce um, hemoglobin. But after the reticular site stage, the RNA is lost and so the mature red blood cell can no longer form hemoglobin. All right. Now let's move on to the regulation of your erythropoiesis. So there are different factors which affect your erythropoiesis and the formation of your red blood cells. The most important is your growth factor, which is important for the proliferation and differentiation of your cells so that they can form your red blood cells. Or your white blood cells etc so for example the scf right which is the stem cell factor is important for working on stem cells um in order for them to differentiate into their specific roles interleukin one acts on stromal cells as well as interleukin five and epo which we said was erythropoietin acts on their late committed cells and early committed cells three four and six so this is important for you um to know so if you need to pause this video and you know look at it a bit further then you can next hypoxia so if there is low oxygen all right this means that you need more cells to increase the amount of oxygen that can be carried and so that your body is not affected by the decrease in oxygen and it still can bring out its function so erythropoiesis is stimulated so that you can create these additional red blood cells to help out in situations like this if there is blood loss you need to increase your blood volume and you're going to lose blood cells so that will trigger the formation of red blood cells as well as if you're anemic so for males if it goes below 15 
or females if it goes below 13 then that will stimulate the body to want to create more red blood cell to compensate for these issues now epo is also of course a regulator of erythropoiesis and epo is stimulated when there is decreasing oxygen tension in your kidneys so 90 percent of your erythropoietin that is produced is in your peritubial intestinal cells of your kidney there's an additional 10 percent of your epo that is synthesized in your liver but you should know that kidney is the major site of erythropoietin production all right so we're going to move on further to ineffective erythropoiesis the last thing that we're going to look on is ineffective erythropoiesis so it is said that erythropoiesis is really not an efficient process reason being 10 percent of your erythroblasts they get destroyed along the way and they don't mature into your red blood cells now this is called intramedullary hemolysis and hemolysis just means the spitting or the breakdown of the red blood cell or destruction of it so your indicators of ineffective erythropoiesis is an increase in reticular side count right usually over two and there is increase in lactate dehydrogenase which is a product that is produced when cells break down as well as unconjugated bilirubin which is produced from hemoglobin breakdown I you know hemoglobin is present so hence there will be an increase in these three parameters now that's it for this video we'll see you in the next one on leukopoiesis until next time bye